the 1997 FIA Formula One Championship turned into a close contest between the world's two fastest drivers, Michael Schumacher and Jacques Villeneuve. You cannot predict what is going to happen. What I'm afraid of is maybe, you know, to be taken out of the race. Jack's words ominous as the championship went down to the wire. Jerez in Spain was the venue for the decider. In the pit lane, it was Ferrari versus Williams. And on the track, it was Schumacher versus Villeneuve. The battle was close, with both teams giving everything they had, but in the end, it was dramatic and controversial, all over in one turn. Ferrari and Schumacher were left to look back on what might have been. But it was Jacques Villeneuve withstanding the pressure over 17 enthralling races to take the coveted title, Williams winning the constructors whilst Mika Hakkinen took his first win. It's just one victory, nothing else. Monaco, 1997. The FIA's Max Mosley introduces new rules for the 98 season. There are a large number of regulation changes for the chassis. Cars will be narrower, instead of two meters wide, one meter 80. The side impact test speed is going up from five meters to seven meters per second. The tires are responsible for an increase in performance greater than any other factor on the car. The biggest problem we've had over the last 25 years has been the steady increase in cornering speeds, which the best efforts have failed to control. The most efficient way of doing this is to put grooves in the tyres. Back to the drawing board as teams design their new cars to meet the 98 rules. We now have a minimum external dimension of the front of the chassis, as well as a minimum internal dimension. So the front of the car looks much uh, squarer. The track is obviously much narrower. You can see that the wheels have been brought in. The cockpit opening is probably not so clear. Uh, there's some changes there in the regulations. Obviously the groove tyres. And there's a much bigger crash structure on the side of the car to comply with the new side impact test. Changing times at Williams. Renault engines are out, Mechachrome engines are in. New livery for Frank's team with every small detail examined in the lead up to their title defense. No changes in the driver lineup. Villeneuve and Heinz Harold Frensen again in the spotlight, but Frensen needs to impress in his second year at Williams. I know the team now, I know my chances and uh, I'm going for it. Defending champion Jacques Villeneuve is confident he and Williams can be competitive in 98 as they were in 97. We know how fast the car can go, uh, and, 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 and now it's new for everyone, so it's, it's much easier to progress. With five constructors' titles in six years, Villeneuve has every reason to feel confident. If you listen to every team and to every engine before every season, they all have the best thing, but there's only one that wins in the end. There's a steep slope for Irvine, Schumacher and Ferrari to climb to reach that elusive top spot. The Italian team are taking great care to keep Formula One's most expensive driver in peak condition. Covers off the new F300. A new car, a new gearbox, a, a new engine, a new type of tyres, so it will be very challenging. Ferrari were concentrating on development in early 1998. We want to win the championship, I mean, that's our ambition. But uh, want to do things and achieve things is two different stories. Schumacher's penalty for the controversial incident with Villeneuve was to help the FIA's road safety campaign. The double world champion will be under enormous scrutiny this year from both the world's press and the Tifosi, who will do anything to get a glimpse of the famous red cars. All change at Benetton with new boss David Richards taking the reins. Two new drivers, Wurtz and Fisichella, a new tyre supplier, Bridgestone, and a new Mechachrome engine. Benetton have had only one race win since Michael Schumacher left the team in 1995, and the new boys know it won't be easy. You know, racing is all about winning. That's what all the drivers, all the 22 drivers want to achieve, but it's very difficult. Alexander Wurtz is driving full-time this year after only three races in 1997. And with Giancarlo Fisichella moving from Jordan, the Italian team have one of the youngest driving lineups in Formula One. <laughs> the 
David Coulthard and Mika Hakkinen are teammates again in 98 and unveil the new McLaren Mercedes with high hopes. Well, for this year, I hope very much that we're in a position to win more races than last year. So, you know, three or four would be very nice. That's what we look into consistency, win the Grand Prix and, and mainly to win the World Championship this year. Among the detail differences are those Bridgestone tyres. It doesn't have the level of degradation that uh, our previous suppliers had and um, that gives us a very good uh, basis on which to develop the car. Designer Adrian Newey arrives, but what of the Mercedes engine? It is stronger, it is lighter and uh, it's hopefully much more reliable. Well, you have to have reliability, otherwise, you know, first to finish first, you first have to finish. The McLarens were very quick in pre-season testing and they may be the team to beat this year. Nineteen ninety-six champion Damon Hill declined an offer from McLaren, opting to join Ralph Schumacher at Jordan. Mugen Honda are powering a new partnership with smiles from Ralph, who was on an even footing with Damon. No, we don't have any number one drivers. We just have number one banana. Which is, I'm number one banana and uh, number two banana. Jordan can't afford any slip-ups as Eddie's team set off in search of their first victory since entering Formula One in nineteen ninety-one. It's an all-French affair as Peugeot combined with Prost to produce the AP01. Olivier Panis and Jarno truly are the driving force. The introduction of a revolutionary carbon fiber gearbox has given the team problems in early testing, but were now said to be resolved. Team boss Alan Prost is confident of the team's prospects. But what is the most important is, uh, is uh, we know that the objective is to be in, uh, between the top teams as quick as possible and uh, the, the objective would be to try to be there this year already. Yeah. Jean Alessi has accepted a drive at Sauber for 98 on the advice of his friend Gerhard Berger and to the delight of Peter Sauber. He joins Johnny Herbert and with a combined total of 248 starts, they are the most experienced pairing in the pit lane. Sauber are now looking to improve on their modest record of three podium appearances in 81 races. The stunning Black Arrows A19, designed by John Barnard, is powered by its own engine, making the Tom Walkinshaw operation only the second team together with Ferrari to build its own power plant. We decided that instead of wasting the money just renting engines from someone, we would invest it and uh, build our own and hopefully get industry support for it. Pedro Daniers is joined by Mika Salo. I was really happy when uh, Tom wanted me to drive for him because uh, I know his reputation in racing and uh, He's got John Barnard designing a car, so it was just everything what I wanted. A traditional Scottish launch for the SF2. Stuart Grand Prix are entering their second year of Formula One with the works Ford engine. Three times world champion Jackie Stewart knows it won't be easy. Historically, a second year is more even difficult than a first year because people expect too much of you in the second year. There are no excuses, oh, well, this is their first year. You don't get off with that any longer. Magnussen and Barrichello are back, hoping to be near the front of the grid. A final crack at Formula One for Ken Tyrrell, bought out by British-American Racing. Tora Takagi is the new Japanese signing. I think we've got a good car, uh, so I think we have the opportunity for a few podium finishes. Harvey Postlethwaite realises the new regulations take time to come to grips with. So I think uh, there'll be an ongoing process of improvement. I think teams will also spark off each other in terms of seeing what everyone else is up to, what progress they've made, and I think there'll be quite a lot of modification as the year goes on. Brazilian Ricardo Rosset has joined to partner Takagi. Since entering Formula One, Minardi have shown resilience and determination in their bid to compete at the top level. The Italian team looked at various drivers, including Dane Tom Christiansen, before taking on Argentine rookie Esteban Tuero and Prost outcar Shinji Nakano, who struggled last year. Minardi know it's a difficult road ahead, but are hoping 1998 is the year they turn the corner.
and so to Melbourne, Australia for round one of the Formula One World Championship. David Coulthard. We reckon Michael Schumacher. <laughs> Jack Villeneuve should win this race. Mika, I think. Definitely. I think he's got it. Before qualifying, no one knew which team would be the quickest. You have to be on the same piece of tarmac on the same day and the same temperature to really know how people perform. So in many ways, it means that Saturday qualifying should be a really exciting time for everyone, you know, for the teams, the people here, and for the spectators at home to, to really find out who has got it right for the first race. As it was, the McLarens dominated the qualifying session with Hakkinen and Coulthard on the front row, the team to beat. The cars have improved so much to last year's cars. I mean, last year our car at this stage was really dreadful. I mean, it was uh, very bad and now we have a real a racing car and that's why we can do it at fast. McLaren obviously has even a better racing car and uh, a better tyre. Race day at Albert Park, fans are treated to a panoramic view of the city. On pole twice previously in Melbourne, defending champion Villeneuve has to settle for fourth today. The large crowd are not the only ones to be blown away by the speed of the McLarens. Hakkinen is on pole with teammate Coulthard alongside him at the head of the grid. Schumacher starts third, a worrying seven tenths of a second adrift. As the lights go out, the 1998 season gets underway. The McLarens are getting a good start with Hakkinen taking the lead at the first corner. There's not much room as the pack threads their way through. Barrichello's having a slow start to the season. The Brazilian has a gearbox problem. Schumacher tries to outbreak Coulthard, but the Scotsman keeps his line holding off the German. There's already a significant gap. Hakkinen, Coulthard, Michael Schumacher, Villeneuve, Giancarlo Fisichella and Johnny Herbert make up the top six. Ralph is having a dive around the outside of Magnussen, but they're both off as Takagi's Tyrrell follows them in sympathy. More trouble for the Schumacher family as Michael pulls onto the grass on lap six. Smoke is pouring from the back of his Ferrari and he shakes his head in disbelief as he realizes that his race is over. What a disastrous start to his season. The flying fin is at the front of the field. Whilst Fisichella is putting some serious pressure on Villeneuve as they approach turn three. But Jacques has it all under control, calmly closing the door. Take it easy, Fizzy. Lap 24 and race leader Mika Hakkinen is coming in for his first scheduled stop and a smooth start to the year for the McLaren pit crew. Coulthard's turn now, sliding wide as he enters the pits. First class service for the Scotsman too. He's sent on his way and is rejoining the circuit in second position behind Hakkinen. The Schumacher brothers are left as disappointed spectators while Villeneuve looks as though he's trying to join them, taking to the grass. Complete domination by the McLaren team as Hakkinen, who is in first, and Coulthard, who is in second, come around to lap the Williams of reigning world champion Jacques Villeneuve. In third is Frenson, in fourth is Irvine. This one will be completely down to the pit crews. The Williams boys keep Heinz Harold in front of Eddie, but Fizzy Keller is now in third. Confusion at McLaren. Hakkinen's arriving in the pit lane, his pit crew nowhere to be seen as he's waved through, and Coulthard takes over the lead. Fizzy Keller's podium chances are gone as he retires with rear wing support failure. Frenson is in third and goes through Coulthard who has now lapped the entire field. Three laps to go and Coulthard is slowing. He's letting Hakkinen through. Mika is into the lead at Albert Park. Herbert is doing everything he can to steal fifth from Villeneuve but Jacques is not surrendering this close to home. Magic in Melbourne for McLaren. Hakkinen takes victory. Coulthard is second and Frenson an entire lap down is third. The overall result was what I wanted to be. <laughs> but the, during the race there was some confusion. And uh, that caused me to come one, one extra stop. And uh, it was purely misunderstanding in the radio communication. Tears of joy for Mika, possibly tears of a different sort for the opposition. McLaren leaving the Formula One world shaken. Eddie Irvine takes fourth place in the sole remaining Ferrari. Disappointment for world champion Jacques Villeneuve in fifth, but a good result for Herbert in sixth. Tyres played a significant part in the race. 
we know that we're still a little bit behind, but Gutierrez has done uh, a major progress uh, since, I would say, January with the tyre. We are not yet up to speed to, to the Bridgestones. Definitely, they, they're trying hard. We have a new tyre for Brazil, which uh, is better, and uh, I'm expecting other things to come. With Bridgestone supplying McLaren and Benetton this year, competition between them and Goodyear will be hotting up, with huge development programmes planned in the bid to stay ahead. Bridgestone celebrated their first Formula One victory in Melbourne. Controversy surrounded the first race. We had an agreement that whoever was to get to the first corner first, um, you know, we wouldn't challenge that person because that was the main part of the race, you know. I was pretty confident with that agreement that I would beat Mika to the first corner, but uh, unfortunately today he made a good start. The contentious pre-arranged agreement between the two teammates would never have come to light had it not been for Hakkinen being called into the pits by the team in error. And when it was clear, when the team explained to me what had happened with his pit stop, you know, I felt that was uh, in keeping with our agreement. So that's why we changed places. David's act demonstrated that there is still room for sportsmanship in Formula One, and Mika appreciates that. Well, I just want to, wanted to, to say uh, for David, thank you very much. I'm not saying this because it's easy for me to say because I won. What David did was just remarkable. Ken Tyrrell steps down from running the team that bears his name after 30 years in the sport he was so passionate about. Known as one of the great innovators of his time, he produced a six-wheeler Grand Prix car, driven here by Jackie Stewart. Ken Tyrrell was hugely successful, collecting three World Driver Championships and two Constructor Championships with Jackie Stewart. But the last win came in 1983 at Detroit, with Alboreto at the wheel. Ken was very adept at spotting and nurturing talented young drivers, such as Jean Alesi, here in 1990 challenging Ayrton Senna for the lead of the USGP. The Australian Grand Prix witnessed the end of an era as Ken says goodbye to the pit lane. Giancarlo Fisichella took an alternative view of the Melbourne track. Giancarlo, OK? So-so. So-so, OK. The end of an era for Goodyear, too, as the Australian Grand Prix marked the first time since 1991 that the ultra-successful Formula One tyre supplier, who can count many champions among their customers, has not won a Grand Prix. Nelson Piquet took the laurels for Pirelli in Canada in that year. Round two, the Interlager circuit, Sao Paulo, Brazil. The home track of Fittipaldi, Piquet and Senna. Little advice is required for Hakkinen, he's on pole. Coulthard slips into second again with Frensen, the best of the rest on the second row, in third. Lose the lights and the power is down. There's no holding the McLarens, but a poor start by Schumacher, who is being passed by Irvine and Wurtz. As Hakkinen leads Coulthard into the first corner, Michael Schumacher dives down the inside of Wurtz, approaching the center S. Ralf Schumacher has overtaken himself and ends his day in the gravel. Villeneuve now attempts to follow Schumacher past Wurtz, but he closes the door. Hakkinen is leading from Coulthard, Frensen, Irvine, Schumacher, Wurtz and Villeneuve. The Ferrari crew watch as their drivers race side by side down the pit straight. Schumacher is getting past Irvine to take fourth position. Patrick Head is keeping a close eye on the opposition. The McLarens are clocking impressive lap times. Michael Schumacher's Ferrari is being held up by Frensen as they battle for third place. Schumacher's pushing hard as he comes in early for his first pit stop, escaping the traffic. While Hakkinen is leading the race convincingly. With fresh tyres, Schumacher wastes no time passing Fisichella's Benetton. Heinz Harald is watching exactly how it's done. Now it's his turn, taking his Williams into the points. Third place Wurtz will have to watch his mirrors as Schumacher and Frensen close in. Lap 45 and Frensen's in for his second stop. A new set of good years for the German and he's on his way. Wurtz is in. Wurtz is out. Frensen goes past as Alexander runs wide onto the kerbs. 
The leader, Mika Hakkinen, is lapping Vilna for the second race in succession. Coulthard is second, McLarens are dominating. Lap 53 and Schumacher's in for his final stop. But there's a problem. Michael stalled the engine. There's an agonizing wait for the frustrated German. They've got it started though and he boots the throttle, coating the pit lane with rubber as he leaves. Frenson and Wurtz are bearing down. The Austrian takes the inside line approaching the corner. A clinical passing maneuver as Schumacher exits the pits to retain third place. The McLarens are pushing their Bridgestones to the maximum. And Hackerton makes it two in a row, winning the Brazilian Grand Prix from Coulthard with Schumacher a full minute behind in third. The Brazilian circuit is a little bit tougher because it is anti-clockwise. Uh, it's quite a lot bumpy at track and uh, the cars are sliding more. But, so it, it's a bit harder work than in, in, uh, in Melbourne. Harder work or not, Hackerton, Coulthard and McLaren make it look all too easy. Another McLaren 1-2 in Brazil. Michael Schumacher opens his account with the two Benetton boys finishing fourth and sixth. Frenson into the points again. There was controversy again surrounding the McLaren team. A revolutionary braking system fitted to their cars was subject to a protest. But could the removal of the system affect the McLaren supremacy? I, I think it's contributing uh, part to, to part of our performance, but... Uh, that's logical because we wouldn't run it if it wasn't giving us something, but it's not the uh, uh, panacea of performance that I think some people believe it to be. Standard Formula One cars have two principal pedals, a brake pedal and a throttle. However, the McLaren has an extra brake pedal, which it has been claimed operates the rear brakes independently, aiding traction out of the corners. Other teams using a similar device include Williams and Jordan. Their systems are thought to be less developed, but they were also subject to the protest by Ferrari. It's not just us have a problem. There's six teams have a problem with a situation of other three teams. So it's not Ferrari against McLaren, it's six teams against three teams. And it's not against three teams, it's against a regulation which is not clear for us, and we want the clarification, that's simple. With the system disengaged for Friday's practice session, the McLaren still managed to top the timesheets. We were fortunate in being the first of the three teams running the system, find a performance advantage within the regulations, and that the only response that a rival team has is to try and uh, find a way to have it banned, as opposed to rising to the technical challenge. The system was declared illegal on Saturday morning. The great thing is we have a decision. Um, we were pretty casual either way, which way it was. We had the technology to put it on or we had the ability to take it off. And uh, at least now we can start racing knowing exactly where we stand. But McLaren's dominance remained intact. It was a good result, good reliability and great weekend. Don't like the politics, but we did it on the circuit. Ferrari were pleased with the new engine that they raced for the first time. It was the first time uh, running a new engine, which uh, survived uh, nicely, it ran quite well. The extra power produced by the new unit, through a change in the valve system allowing it to rev higher, didn't help Michael Schumacher when he made an uncharacteristic mistake and stalled whilst pitting. We had a bit of a worrying moment uh, in the second pit stop when the engine died, but uh, mechanics had done a good job to, to get it running. After reoccurring problems with photographers, McLaren boss Ron Dennis has introduced security measures around his pit garage to ensure the privacy of sensitive information. However, he was unable to protect his cars while stranded on the circuit. But the team owner will be keeping an eye on the offenders. Buenos Aires, Argentina for round three of the 1998 Formula One World Championship. The crowd are hoping it won't be another processional race. David Coulthard is all smiles as he takes the first pole of the season. Schumacher, who's joining him on the front row, will be keeping an eye on his mirrors for Mika Hakkinen, who is back in third. The spectators are revving up as they and the drivers anticipate the start. Lights out and they're off. A great start by the McLarens with Frenson pulling alongside Irvine into the first corner. Frenson has the inside line and takes the position. 
Coulthard leads Hakkinen, who was ahead of Schumacher as the field come around without incident. Schumacher is wasting no time and is right behind Hakkinen's McLaren. He sees an opening and seizes it to take second. Teammate Eddie Irvine squeezes Frenson onto the grass to take fourth place. Schumacher now has race leader Coulthard in his sights. Frenson, who has a problem with his front wing, can do little to stop teammate Villeneuve getting past. A gear shift problem for Coulthard on lap five. He's run wide. Schumacher's spotted a gap. Can he squeeze through? No! They've collided. Coulthard spinning, Schumacher is into the lead. A concerned Ron Dennis, but DC's kept it going and is now behind Villeneuve and Alessi in sixth place. Lap 28 and race leader Michael Schumacher is coming in for his first pit stop. Ross Braun checks for front end damage. Everything okay as he rejoins in second behind Hakkinen. Mika is coming up to lap Frenson, but he's being held up, which could cost him later. Villeneuve is pulling out of Coulthard's slipstream as they approach the turn. He's got the line and takes it. Ron Dennis points the way as Hakkinen makes his first and only stop on lap 42. And exits the pits in second behind Schumacher, who takes the lead. Damon Hill has hit Herbert Sauber and torn off his front wing. Back to the pits for a new nose. And Johnny retires from the race with a puncture. Lap 52 and Villeneuve locks a wheel. A coming together with Coulthard who spins again. Onto the grass for the battered Scotsman who manages to continue but Jacques' race is over. Alexander Wurtz has a look down the inside of Irvine. No gap there says Eddie barging Wurtz out of the way. But the Benetton driver won't give up and as Irvine locks up Wurtz sees an opportunity and nips through into third as the pit lane cheer him on. Local boy Esteban Tuero exits dramatically, losing it under braking for turn one. There's a change in the weather as leader Michael Schumacher wipes the rain from his visor. The marshals warn of slippery conditions, a warning unheeded by Wurtz, who is spinning whilst attempting to lap a back marker and allowing Eddie Irvine through for third. Lap 65 and we're on board with Coulthard as he passes Fisichella to move up into sixth and incredibly into the points. Only five laps left to run for the leader now, and that's Schumacher. He's lost it, straight over the grass and into the gravel. Jean Todt can't believe it. A lucky escape for Michael, who rejoins, still in the lead. Coulthard is tailing a Lacey. Late on the brakes, and he's off again and rejoins for the third time this race. Michael Schumacher takes his and Ferrari's first win of the season. Congratulations all round. Hacken in his second, 23 seconds later. A pumped up Schumacher is bringing the Ferrari home to an elated team and fans. This time I had the chance and I took it and it uh, ended well for me. Schumacher jumps back into contention. Schumacher's win takes his points tally to 14, with Hakkinen now on 26 and Coulthard on 13. The championship battle is beginning to take shape. There's no doubt that the pivotal moment in Buenos Aires occurred on lap 5 as Schumacher passed Coulthard for the lead, taking no prisoners and giving Ferrari the advantage. The two drivers differed in their opinion of who was to blame. He ran white, I then went inside, same like uh, with Mika, but David uh, seemed to close the door and no room to go and I didn't see, didn't feel like I wanted to lift off because I felt I had the, the mo momentum going. Yeah, but you, you went inside, I was there and you, you closed the door. We let you know the lane. Yeah, I think it was quite clearly I was in front. If you look at my car, it's the side of my car that his wheel is hit. You know, Michael's a very aggressive driver, so is unlikely to think that he's going to just lift. Playing catch-up meant the DC had to take chances, leading to more incidents. Jack's another one. Like uh, Michael, who's never prepared to give an inch, even if, uh, even if they're slightly behind. It requires him to be a little bit fair. And, uh, I don't know, he just drove into the side of me. You know, in, in a way, uh, I'm the one who hit him, so... Uh, who, who knows whose fault it is? It doesn't really matter at this point. Coulthard was involved in yet another incident, this time with Alessi, and remarkably he still managed to take his McLaren to the finish. After dominating the first two rounds, an anomaly at Argentina was Mika Hakkinen's pace. A fine start saw him ahead of Michael Schumacher, but it wasn't long before the German's Ferrari was back in front, finishing the race over 30 seconds ahead. A contributory factor to the extent of the gap was the time it took Mika to lap Frenson's Williams. Well, it's pretty unsatisfactory. I think uh, 
it's quite a few incidents, but the, the thing that lost us the race was Frenzen. I mean, uh, it's ludicrous. It was six seconds in one lap. With a mere six points between them in the first two races, many were surprised at both Ferraris making it to the podium. Including Mika Hakkinen, who was the meat in the Italian sandwich. So I expected them to be close, but not this close. <laughs> One explanation for Ferrari's change in fortunes was the introduction of a new Goodyear front tyre, noticeably wider. The new tyres, for me, was a big difference. It just gives you a lot more front end, mid corner. Before, we were always turning in, a little bit loose in the rear, and then waiting on the front. Now, the rear can still be a bit loose, but you don't wait on the front. You immediately get on the par. Changing conditions late in the race, a damp track made things difficult, even for Michael Schumacher and it just started to drizzle and there's a, a, just a patch that was wet and I just caught that and lost the rear end and just went straight on. So I didn't even try to break, I just went straight through to come back on the other end and back on the circuit. Michael Schumacher hit the news this week when Argentine coach Daniel Passarella gave the German a trial with the club. With the World Cup only months away, it was hoped that Schumacher's expertise in taking out opponents and getting away with it, as witnessed by Hill, Villeneuve and Coulthard, would rub off on the team. I should have stayed in bed, I wasn't concentrating, was a Lacey's excuse for taking out teammate Johnny on their very first lap of the Argentine circuit. It was just the installation lap, basically, and as I came into the hairpin, I knew it was Jean behind. I got hit, so I knew it was Jean. Uh, and then when we was on the grass, uh, definitely it was Jean who, who hit me. Deep in the heart of Ferrari territory. But who do the locals tip for victory? Schumacher. Schumacher! Schumacher! Schumacher. David Coulthard. Nakano. Schumacher! Schumacher has it then. The Ferrari fans are out in force for the San Marino Grand Prix at Imola in Italy. David Coulthard's on pole again with Mika Hakkinen beside him on the front row of the grid. But the majority of the huge crowd have come to see one man, Michael Schumacher, who starts third today. Lights out, and they're ready to go. The two McLarens followed by the two Ferraris. Problems for Wurtz, though. He's dropping back. There's trouble at the back of the field. There goes Barrichello's rear wing across the circuit. What happened, Paul Stewart? Obviously, Jan must have been behind Rubens because it was Rubens' rear wing that's come undone and Jan's front wing. Very disappointing and quite really not what we need right now. Coulthard is leading, closely pursued by Hakkinen, Michael Schumacher, Villeneuve and Irvine. Lap two and Damon's in the pits for a new nose after clipping Verts. Back to the action at the front and David Coulthard already has a comfortable gap to Mika in second. Hill's back in the thick of it, edging his Jordan past Nakano's Bernardi. Whilst McLaren pilot Mika Hakkinen has a problem. Team boss Ron Dennis is calling him in. The Finn has a broken gearbox and pulls in for good. Fisichella is having an off, hitting the tyre barriers hard. Fortunately, he's OK. Coulthard is looking to lap Deniz as the Brazilian's engine fails. A terminal problem for Wurtz. We have a problem in the start. He got stuck in third gear and it damaged the engine. Lap 27 and things are hotting up. The end of Nakano's race. Eddie Irvine can certainly stand the heat as a charging Vilner pursues him for third. Riding with the Irishman now as he runs offline and back on track. Hill passes Solo's arrows for 10th place. Eddie Irvine enters the pits just behind third place Villeneuve. A quick stop by the Ferrari crew, but they're in a flap at Williams. Villeneuve is forced to concede a position, and Patrick Head is furious the fuel flap wouldn't open. 14 laps to go, and there goes Coulthard, leading by 21 seconds. Schumacher has just set the fastest lap, though. Can he catch the McLaren? The Mugen engine ends Hill's eventful race early. Coulthard is still out in front. But Ron Dennis is keeping a close eye on the catching Ferrari of Michael Schumacher, who is just six seconds behind with one lap remaining. 
David Coulthard is rounding the last few corners now. Schumacher's not giving up though, chasing hard to the end. Tense times in the garage. As David Coulthard takes his first win of the season, followed closely by Michael Schumacher in second to the jubilation of the Tifosi. Irvine takes third with Villeneuve fourth, just behind. Hakkinen is happy for his teammate who deserved the win after a very strong showing. Today our car was running quicker and I think that's shown by the fact that we were able to open such a big gap before the pit stops. But uh, I think we had enough in hand that it would be very difficult for Michael to get close to us. The sweet taste of victory for Coulthard who will be raring to go for the next encounter. A great win for the Scot in Italy and 10 valuable points towards the championship battle. The two Williams and the Sauber of Jean Alesi round off the top six. The first sign of weakness in the all-conquering McLaren surfaced at Imola. Championship points leader Mika Hakkinen having his race cut short, retiring on lap 17 with mechanical failure. Well, I lost the fourth gear and without that it is impossible to continue racing really. So obviously you can imagine I'm very disappointed but I guess uh, I, have, I have a lot of experience in my career to, to have situations like this but it happened so nothing what I can do now. Mika was pragmatic, but the Finns' retirement caused concern for teammate David Coulthard. The team informed me that Mika was out, but you know, clearly I could see that anyway. And I didn't ask what the problem was, uh, because I didn't want to be thinking about that particular, you know, listening for noises with the engine, or I don't even know now what the problem was. It was after the second set of pit stops that the San Marino Grand Prix truly came alive, climaxing into a nail-biting finish. DC, with 15 laps to go, was 20 seconds ahead of Michael Schumacher's Ferrari, but the German was hot on the Scotsman's heels, circulating at over a second per lap faster. Basically, I was just trying to, to run a, a race that wasn't too hard on the brakes or the engine and just try and maintain the gap to Michael, so I was perfectly comfortable to let, let that gap reduce because I knew that I could go a little bit quicker. So the only worry in doing something like that is that if you get a problem, then you don't have so much time in hand. 10 laps from the checkered flag and the gap was down to 15 seconds. David was suffering reliability problems, but still managed to hold off the flying Ferrari. We had some debris in the uh, cooling system and we were really struggling to keep the oil temperature at an uh, acceptable to level. So uh, we just took the whole gap and used it for reliability. We could have gone much quicker, but it was unnecessary. The controversial and ugly side wings that many of the teams have been using this season have been banned by the FIA on safety grounds. Team owner Eddie Jordan. When one takes into consideration the efforts that were made by a team, of course it's disappointing, but um, we were one of the people who got some real advantage out of these uh, side wings. I think, to be truthful about it, there was a impairing of vision from a driver's point of view in terms of what he could actually see. And if there is a question ever of safety, you have to decide on the, the, on the safety aspect. The FIA's ruling will put an end to incidents such as this seen in Argentina this year. A young Mika Hakkinen, seen here at the beginning of his Grand Prix career, driving for the now defunct Lotus team, had at least something to celebrate after his disappointing race, his 100th Grand Prix start. But what did he think of his big brown cake? Very tasty, very nice. Barcelona in sunny Spain is the venue for the fifth round of the Formula One World Championship. The spectators and marshals are enjoying the weather. While Mika Hakkinen enjoys his third pole position of the season, Coulthard makes it another all-McLaren front row with Michael Schumacher in third. King Juan Carlos of Spain welcomes actor Anthony Quinn to the Grand Prix. Adrenaline pumping as the 21 drivers race off the grid. Hakkinen and Coulthard are cleanly away, but a poor start by Michael Schumacher allows Fisichella and Irvine to get past him. Into Elf, turn one, Hakkinen leads Coulthard as Irvine takes Fisichella for third. On board with Michael Schumacher, but the young Italian closes the door. 
With the two McLarens beginning to pull away, Ferrari and Benetton lead the pursuit. Franson's lost it, but he's managed to keep the engine running. What happened? It looks as if he made contact with a Lacey while sparring for position. Hakkinen with a huge gap to Coulthard already. He's flying. A double blow for Arrows as Diniz and Salo's engines both let go simultaneously. Terrible luck for Tom Walkinshaw. Irvine third is in for a pit stop on lap 25 and Fisichella fourth is right behind him. The race is on. The two teams pitted against each other and Ferrari win. Two laps later now and Michael Schumacher is joining the pit lane pandemonium. A professional job by his crew see the German ace out in third and in front of Irvine, who helped his teammate by holding Fisichella back. At nearly 200 miles per hour, Fisichella is looking around the outside of Irvine into turn one. Giancarlo turns in, contact, off they go. The dust may take a while to settle on this one as the hot Italian remonstrates with Eddie. No such problems for Mika Hakkinen. The Finn has the track all to himself out front. An unscheduled stop for Schumacher, allowing Wurtz to move into third. Michael is receiving a 10-second penalty for speeding in the pit lane, as the Ferrari rejoins to start lap 41 in fourth place with some serious catching to do. Benetton's Alexander Wurtz is in for his crucial second stop. But there are anxious faces at Jordan. Damon Hill's engine has had enough for today. Lap 48 and Schumacher calls on the Ferrari pit crew again. Barrichello in fifth is doing everything he can to hold off the reigning world champion. Schumacher owes his pit crew a big thank you. He's managed to slip ahead of Wurtz, the Austrian now in fourth. Coulthard has narrowed the gap to Hakkinen to nine seconds, but it's Mika's day as he delightedly takes the checkered flag for the third time this year. I would say with the lead like that and victory like that, you could say the victory was easy, but it's actually never easy. All the time have to make sure about, uh, about your concentration. You have to really, really be careful. Overtaking pack markers was very enjoyable, but, but also quite demanding. More champagne for McLaren, who are taking a real liking to the bubbly this year. Hakkinen and Coulthard take McLaren's third 1-2 of the season. Rubens Barrichello breaks Stewart's duck with a fine fifth ahead of world champion Jacques Villeneuve. The talk of the pit lane in Barcelona was the radical new exhaust system introduced by Ferrari. The system exits out the top of the engine cover, maximizing the efficiency of the new 047 engine. Exhaust gases are now directed away from the sensitive rear wing supports, exiting upward through the engine cover. Previously, the gases were directed much lower through the rear of the car. Ross Braun explains its advantages. They give the car a little bit more stability on the throttle, a little bit better handling. Um, but uh, it's not a cure-all, yet we've still, uh, still got a lot of work to do. The tape, as you call it, is quite a sophisticated insulation system uh, for the rear wing structure to make sure there's uh, no problems there. Uh, refueling, the systems are a completely sealed system for both fuel and vapour. Um, refueling is not completely risk-free, but we haven't increased it uh, with what we've done, so you no know, concerns. Clearly our target's to be in front of the Ferraris now, and uh, I think that's an achievable goal. That was Fisichella's goal, but Irvine disagreed. Basically, I put a lot of fuel in to do the middle stint, because um, I want to go very long. I was slow out of the last corner, so heavy, and just go down at the straight, he was on the outside, I was on the inside protecting his position and he just hit the brakes and came straight across over on me and I had to stand on the brakes very hard to stop hitting him and two of us touched and that was it, we were away. However, there are always two sides to every incident. We saw him slow on the previous lap in Vault Q and then you backed off and then the next time it was your corner, there's no question about it. You did a very good job. You had to go back to one lap before to really see where it all started. And clearly on one lap before that corner was for Fizzy, but he backed out of it and, and Irvine pushed his way through. I think second time round, Fizzy Keller was not going to back off. And I, I think looking at the tape quite clearly, Fizzy every right to feel aggrieved. The passionate Italian is putting across his version of events to the Ferrari number two.
Since Bernie Eccleston and Sylvester Stallone signed a film agreement last year, the Hollywood film star has been doing his research, while Jason Priestley is rumoured to want a part. Tyrrell's Ricardo Rossett was the first driver this year to fail to qualify, falling foul of the FIA rule that all drivers must set a time within 107% of pole position. The Brazilian missed the cut by just six hundredths of a second. Meanwhile, Williams had their worst qualifying session since lining up 14th and 16th at Phoenix in 89. Last year, Villeneuve took pole. This year, he could only manage 10th place, pushing his car to the absolute limit and beyond. Frustration for technical director Patrick Head. Frustration too for Heinz Harold Frensen, pictured here coming round to complete his qualifying lap in a very disappointing 13th position. Monte Carlo in the tiny principality of Monaco is home to the rich and famous, with an atmosphere no other circuit on the calendar can match. Also unmatched is Mika Hakkinen at home on pole. Coulthard is in second and after fourth on the grid last year, Fisichella has improved to third in 98, ahead of a disappointed Schumacher who starts fourth. Concentration on the lights as the race gets underway. The McLarens are off the grid well and leading the field cleanly through the first corner. On board with Villeneuve, taking us through saint devote and up the hill. Hakkinen, Coulthard, Fisichella, Schumacher, Wurtz and Frensen making up the top six. Hakkinen's building up a lead and is in complete control. DC is playing catch-up. Whilst Fisichella is battling to hold off Michael Schumacher. Lap turn into Lowe's hairpin and Irvine wants sixth from Frensen. Unconventional Eddie, but he's through, although Heinz Harold is finished. Coulthard's coming out of the tunnel, the Mercedes engine blowing, ending his race in spectacular style. Engine designer Mario Illion can only look on. Michael Schumacher has passed Giancarlo Fisichella in the first round of pit stops as Coulthard walks home. Hakkinen is getting away with a scrape at Rascas. Lap 38 and Michael Schumacher has caught Wurtz as Alexander is held up by the pack. A passing opportunity for the Ferrari driver, who's giving Wurtz a nudge rounding Los. The Austrian is not giving up though, and repasses going into Portier running wide. Michael has another go. A harder knock this time, as the German goes through. On the limit of adhesion, the Ferrari looks in trouble, and Jean Tart knows it. Schumacher is into the pits, a problem at the rear of the car. A technical knockout according to the mechanics, and Michael is getting out. Ross Braun doesn't look so sure though and is telling the Ferrari number one to get back into the hot seat. Meanwhile back on track, Mika is serene, streets ahead of the rest. After a lengthy delay, Schumacher is rejoining the fray way down. Wurtz is losing it coming out of the tunnel and that's a heavy impact into the Armco. The Austrian is helpless as his Benetton careers out of control and into the tyre barrier. Thankfully, he's all right. Lap 60 and Fisichella is up to second, but he drops it at Rascas, spinning violently. The Benetton driver has managed to keep the engine going. No damage done to the relief of the pit crew. Disappointment for Alessi as the Frenchman's gearbox fails whilst in fifth. Mika Salo is storming along in fourth. A great result for the Arrows team. The troublesome Sauber bringing Jean to his knees. Hakkinen, meanwhile, has brought the entire field to its knees. It's Mika's first win in the Principality and another win for the mighty McLaren. Giancarlo Fisichella takes second in front of a jubilant Benetton team. Schumacher ends a dreadful day tangling with Deniers on the last lap. Pedro is in the points. But it's undoubtedly Hakkinen who is the shining star of today. Winning Monte Carlo is always a dream, always has been a dream. I think it's most of the Grand Prix drivers' victory of the Monte Carlo is, is something very special for them. And, and this now happened to me, and, and it's just hard to believe it yet.
A great day for Tom Walkinshaw and Arrows, with Salo finishing fourth and Deniz in sixth, while consistent Villeneuve is in the point again in fifth place. After six rounds, Mika Hakkinen leads the driver's standings by a massive 17 points over teammate David Coulthard in second, with Michael Schumacher in third. In the Constructors' Championship, the McLaren team are dominating with 75 points. Ferrari in second have some catching to do on 39. Eddie Irvine, the straight-talking Irishman, embroiled himself in controversy again in Monaco, barging past the Williams of Heinz Harold Frensen on lap nine and finishing the Germans' race. You can pussyfoot around the whole race behind the guy and, it, you know, it's not, you're not going to do any good. You've got to get stuck in. And I thought actually he would have been able to continue, but it, he seemed to bounce wide or something. I don't know. I couldn't afford to sit behind him. He was way too slow. Monaco raised questions about the reliability of the Mercedes engine, which proved troublesome last year. Coulthard's race and chances of closing the points gap between himself and Mika went up in smoke on lap 17 when his engine let go coming out of the tunnel. And I was just wanting to try and put a bit of pressure on when the engine tightened in the tunnel and uh, blew up on the exit. You know, you have to expect when things have been pushed to the limit that eventually things will fail. Very unusual, so uh, we just have to get over this one and go to Canada and try and get victory then. He was as quick as Mika could have fought for victory. And the, the whole team did not make one mistake, it was only us, uh, the engine. Sorry for that, but it was a great victory for, for Mika. And, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be part of the team. A highlight of the race was the way Formula One novice Alexander Wurz dealt with the pressure he received from Michael Schumacher. In a perfectly executed move, Schumacher passed the young Austrian at Lurs, but the Benetton driver came straight back at him. However, a substantial banging of wheels had far-reaching effects for both drivers. Well, he said he'd broken the rear suspension, so he just decided to get out. Uh, Monaco's a race, lots can happen, and maybe it rains, so uh, we thought we'd fix it and see what would happen. Vert's problems were a little more dramatic. Alexander sustaining several heavy impacts on his way to the chicane, unable to steer or brake. We're not sure what happened with Alex. Um, it looks like something broke, and we think that's probably a result of the incident with Schumacher. But we'll have to analyse that. With his suspension repaired, Michael Schumacher rejoined the circuit, although his race was pretty much over, being two laps down on the leaders. His incidents weren't over, though, seen here on the last lap, just avoiding taking out sixth place Diniz and losing his front wing. Double celebrations for Mika in the south of France. One professional winning the most coveted Grand Prix of the year in just six races after taking his maiden victory. The other personal, marrying his longtime sweetheart, Aya. I do that and you, and you do a nude shower scene with Sharon Stone, fair enough? Glamour at Monaco with Sly Stallone, Hugh Grant and Liz Hurley. Manchester United's Ryan Giggs, Phil Collins visiting the Stewart team. Chris de Berg and the Duchess of York, with Monaco's own royalty keeping team owners and drivers busy. Montreal's rock station. The tunes, baby, here we go. F1, F1, F1. The Gilles Villeneuve circuit in Montreal, Canada welcomes Formula One's own version of horsepower. It's Jacques Villeneuve's hometown, but McLaren's front row. David Coulthard is first, Mika Hakkinen is second, and Michael Schumacher is third, hoping to shut down the McLarens. Tension mounts as the revs climb, lights out, and they're away. Ralph Schumacher has stalled his Jordan, whilst brother Michael is taking second off Hakkinen and pressuring Coulthard. Huge shunt, Alexander Wurtz takes to the air over a Lacey. Jarno Trulli is showing the shaken Benetton driver the way back to the pit lane. The replay shows the Austrian losing it on the approach to the center hairpin and barrel rolling across the gravel track. A miraculous escape. John Alesi, Jano Trulli and Alexander Wurtz are in their spare cars, but the unfortunate Johnny Herbert starts from the pit lane. Take two, Coulthard is off the line well, but Hakkinen has a problem. No gears as the field stream past him. Ralph Schumacher is out of shape, losing it in front of the stampeding pack. Hill is through safely, but not so lucky as Alesi as Trulli double parks. 
Eddie Irvine is another victim as the race continues. Schumacher is drawing alongside Fisichella as they approach the casino hairpin. Taking the outside line, he's moving into second position behind the McLaren of David Coulthard. Irvine's three-wheeler manages to reach the pit to replace the damaged Goodyear, but it's the end of the road for Mika. Irvine rejoins at the back of the field whilst the safety car is departing as lap six begins. Coulthard is leading Schumacher, Fisichella and Villeneuve. Michael's filling DC's mirrors. As Deniz loses control of his arrows, taking to the grass as he quite literally lays down a hazard for the others. The safety car is employed again to restore order. Michael Schumacher is pushing Coulthard and his McLaren to the limit now, and DC's throttle linkage gives up, letting Schumacher through into the lead. Lap 18, and it's a heavy impact for Solo, throwing debris in all directions. Schumacher's taken a canny pit stop and is racing out with Frentzen bearing down. He gives his fellow countryman no room, and the Williams has nowhere to go. Jock's clearly furious as Heinz Harold shows his disgust and Patrick Head remonstrates with a Ferrari pit wall. Oliver Gavin's safety car heads race leader Fisichella, Villeneuve and Schumacher. Lap 23 and the race is on. Villeneuve goes for the lead in his home Grand Prix, smoking his good years. He's outbraked himself and takes a trip across the gravel. A fast acting pit crew are ready to replace both front and rear wings, but it's ruined his race chances. Just over halfway and Fisichella is leading from Michael Schumacher. But the German must serve a stop-go penalty for his part in the incident with Frenton. Michael waits, his punishment served. As Giancarlo leads the Canadian Grand Prix. Schumacher's come out right behind his old sparring partner Damon Hill. Not for the faint-hearted as Hill attempts to keep his second place, but Michael takes it. Lap 44 and Fisichella's in for his only pit stop. Schumacher is taking the opportunity to put in some scorching laps. Hill retires with an electrical problem, leaving Eddie frustrated. Schumacher's in for his second scheduled stop. It's a fast one, bringing him out in front of Fisichella's Benetton to take the lead. Irvine is continuing a remarkable run through the field, holding off Wurtz for third as Michael Schumacher wins the Canadian Grand Prix. We knew we were close to the McLarens this weekend. I had a good race up to uh, David's problem. I don't know what strategy he was on, but I was uh, definitely faster, but there was no way to, to get by. It was obviously a good situation for me to score the full points and, and them no points to, to catch up in the championship. Michael Schumacher celebrates 10 championship points. A superb day for Jackie Stewart, his boys finishing fifth and sixth to bring home the team's first points of the year, while Fisichella takes another second place finish in a row. Montreal's tight first turn saw two start lap accidents. The first was almost inevitable, as the grid bunched up to avoid Ralph Schumacher's stalled Jordan. Wurtz was squeezed onto the grass by Jean Alesi before spinning into a multiple roll. Thankfully, he was OK and took the restart. Avoiding action was again required when Hakkinen's McLaren left the grid at a leisurely pace and the over-exuberant Ralph Schumacher, trying to make up for a slow start, lost control of his Jordan, spinning in front of a charging field. The unfortunate Jean Alesi and Jano Trulli, both involved in the first accident, were also caught up in the second, both damaging their spare chassis and out for good this time. Wurtz avoided the mayhem to finish in the points. This was the most crazy race in my whole career. I'm happy to finish fourth because it's another few points for me, even with uh, the collision at the start what happened. Overall, it uh, was my first time. And in the end, with fourth place, I'm really happy. Accusations were rife as Schumacher explains to Fisichella how Hill attempted to block him. The Ferrari driver eventually got through. If someone wants to kill you, he can do it in a different way because we're going down there 320 kilometers per hour. Somebody moving three times the line, that's simply impossible. You can do it once, you go from one side to the other side, that's it, that's what we usually do. But you can't move three times. Well, I mean, we were racing for, posi for position and I knew that uh, I had to hold him up as much as possible uh, within, within the bounds of the rules. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, I mean, I knew where it was, but he still managed to get through. He's a hell of a driver. 
Hill knew where Schumacher was, but the Ferrari driver claimed that he was unaware of Frentzen's position when he exited the pits and moved across the track, forcing the Williams off the circuit while braking from 180 miles per hour. I can only imagine what happened, and if that happened, I really have to excuse, because I went down the pit lane, I looked to my right uh, to see where, whether there is someone. I didn't see anyone, so I pulled over to get on the line. And uh, in the mirrors, it's, it's Im almost impossible to, to see things, and I really don't know what happened. I have to look at video, but if I have done anything, I just uh, want to excuse myself. Michael may have excused himself, but Patrick Head hasn't. He will do everything to get him thrown out of this race, and maybe for a lot more reasons. I'm really disappointed because we could have made good points today. Many people in front of us fall off, and uh, the race was, wasn't still over. We had a good race strategy, everything was running fine. Despite his first ever Formula One point, Jan Magnussen has lost his seat at Stewart after a disappointing season. His berth is taken by Dutchman Jos Verstappen. and the French Grand Prix for round eight of the World Championship. With the World Cup in full swing around the country, it's the place to be for sport. On pole is Mika Hakkinen looking to defend his championship lead. Second on the grid, Michael Schumacher is focusing on passing, while David Coulthard in third still has victory as his goal. Kick-off in France, but the amber grid lights are lit, signaling an aborted start. Verstappen is stranded on the grid as the drivers race off. An unfortunate start for Jos, who replaces the underperforming Magnussen at the Stewart Ford team. The field comes around to take their grid positions as the Dutchman resumes his composure. Lights out! Irvine and Villeneuve are getting a good start. Schumacher is leading. Eddie is passing Hakkinen for second as Villeneuve gets by Coulthard. DC is now demonstrating the Mercedes engine's power advantage as he retakes Villeneuve's Williams for fourth. Ross Braun is telling Schumacher to put his foot down and the German is responding brilliantly. Lap 19 and Irvine in second is attracting the attention of the two McLarens. Hakkinen dives up the inside, misses his down change and loses his back end right in front of team boss Ron Dennis. But he pulls it together and resumes in fourth. Hard chargers Ralf Schumacher and Alexander Wurz touch, racing for position. But it's the German who comes off worse, having to pit for a new steering arm. A double blow for Jordan. Hill's arriving with a terminal hydraulic problem. Damon's race is over, but Ralf continues. Riding with Coulthard as he weaves past Irvine, a beautifully executed move. Lap 32, Fisichella is up the inside of Alessi, a little too optimistic, damaging his front wing and suffering the indignity of being lapped by race leader Michael Schumacher. Second place David Coulthard is in for his second stop on lap 55. There's a problem with a fuel hose and he's stationary for 37 seconds with no fuel taken. A distraught Ron Dennis is trying to sort out the problem with the equipment. Irvine, now in second, fends off Mika Hakkinen. While Herbert's season nearly goes from bad to worse, just missing truly. DC's in again. His McLaren is running on fumes as his team tried desperately to get the hose in, but there's more problems. Finally, some success. A dispirited Ron Dennis knows it's too late. Eddie Irvine is soaking up the pressure from Hakkinen. No pressure on Schumacher though, out in front all day to take the 30th Grand Prix victory of his career and his third of the season. Irvine and Hakkinen are still racing to the very end. One corner to go and Hakkinen has just one last stab up the inside. But second goes to Irvine, Mika settling for third. The Ferrari team celebrate as they take their first 1-2 since the days of Nigel Mansell and Alain Prost. I was just uh, crossing finger for Eddie that he can stay ahead, uh, first for the team and second obviously for my own. 
and uh, taking away some points of Miko. Schumacher and Ferrari are looking dangerous as the season develops. Double trouble for McLaren as Ferrari take the initiative. Hakkinen is third, Villeneuve is fourth, Wurz is fifth, and Coulthard takes the final point. The result of the French Grand Prix was decided at the beginning. At the first start, Mika Hakkinen left the grid in first place and immediately opened up a lead. But the race was red flagged because of the stalled Stewart of Verstappen. We don't need to talk about the first start because that was top, but it went fantastic, the first one. Unfortunately for Mika, the first start didn't count and his second didn't go as well. The start was everything today and, and uh, I felt my second start. I dropped in third and thank you, that's it. With Irvine out dragging Mika at the restart, he was able to protect Schumacher's lead in the race. Both of us uh, did a fantastic start and uh, we jumped the McLaren's and that was uh, one of the decisions for the race. But an unhappy Ron Dennis complaining of inconsistency in the application of the rules. In Canada, there was a, the, the race wasn't stopped when there was cars on top of each other. Uh, here it was stopped when there was a car offline. Yellow flags or a safety car would have been adequate. If they were in doubt, then they got to stop it. You know, it's, it's not worth gambling, you know, with uh, people's lives just because Ron Dennis wants to win a race. We're on the up and the pressure's on them and it, you can see it's starting to fall apart. With two race wins in a row for Schumacher, the momentum is with Ferrari. And Mika Hakkinen and McLaren are having to push themselves that much harder, which is leading to more mistakes. But whether France was representative of the rest of the season, we shall have to wait and see. To compound McLaren's problems at Magny Corps, the team experienced difficulties with David Coulthard's refueling rig at his second pit stop. The nozzle is actually a sequential, has a sequential process which uh, provides for uh, an interlocking mechanism which uh, doesn't allow the fuel to flow until it's locked and that just jammed. The team eventually managed to get some fuel in. Uh, we just have to be a bit more diligent. We have to take responsibility in the end, but uh, it was to a certain degree out of, out of our control. British-American racing set up by Craig Pollock is on the verge of signing Jacques Villeneuve for next season. Any experienced driver, and especially a world champion, would be taking a huge risk to come towards a brand new team. <laughs> of course, I'd love to have Jacques Villeneuve on board, but I know that uh, Mr. Williams would like to keep him on board, and there's a couple of other teams who would like to take him away from Mr. Williams. I've been linked to Jacques for so many years, and you write it's actually since 1982. I could look at Jacques Villeneuve straight in the eye the same way as I could look at Damon Hill and say, I think we could now give you a package that you could build up to compete with. Formula One flies into Silverstone for the British Grand Prix. Music to McLaren's ears as Mika Hakkinen takes his sixth pole of the season. He's blown the Ferrari of Schumacher back into second on the grid. And with wild conditions prevailing, Villeneuve is happy to be in third. All eyes are on the lights as the Battle of Britain begins. Off they race, starting on a damp track, and Alessi's made a tremendous start from eighth on the grid. He's passed Frenson, Villeneuve, and Irvine to take fourth. Hakkinen retains his advantage, leading Schumacher, Coulthard, Alessi, Villeneuve, and Frenson. Lap five, Coulthard is pulling alongside Schumacher. Into the chicane, side by side. Coulthard's reward is second. Norbert Haug is euphoric. Ralph, who started at the back, is now slicing his way through the field. As is Eddie, after being stuck in third gear at the start, losing early places, but he's picking them up now, passing Frenson for fifth. That's Hill spinning out of his home Grand Prix on lap 14 and adding another blow to Eddie Jordan's miserable and so far pointless season. Hakkinen's opening out a considerable lead, but also opening are the heavens. With the Saubers now, and fifth place Herbert, who is on a one-stop strategy, is leading two-stopper Alessi. Johnny let Jean through other pit orders and he's waving the Frenchman by, but he has to take a hand off the wheel and he's off. 
The British driver sits there helpless and is understandably a little upset. Hakkinen still leading, but Coulthard's right behind him. Mikasalo is caught out on lap 27. His race is over. Conditions are deteriorating and Hakkinen has zero visibility as he comes round to lap the back of the field. Coulthard flies off the circuit, reversing at high speed across the gravel. Lap 38 is his last. DC's not the only one caught out as Villeneuve, Shinji Nakano and Benetton's Alexander Wurtz lose traction, but all managing to rejoin. As Hakkinen charges through bridge, the ultra-fast right-hander, and he's lost it across the gravel, across the grass, and lucky to rejoin without losing the lead. With the rain relentless, the safety car's out, and Hakkinen's 38-second lead is washed away. Oliver Gavin in his Mercedes pulls off the track as Hakkinen in his Mercedes looks to rebuild his advantage over a determined Michael Schumacher in second. Hakkinen is under enormous pressure now and he's blown it, running wide at Beckett's. Schumacher is the new race leader. More pressure for Mika as the second Ferrari of Irvine menacingly looms in. They can sense victory at Ferrari, but there's another twist. That's a penalty notice for Michael Schumacher. The Ferrari ace is continuing, putting in some sensational laps, and he crosses the finishing line whilst coming in for his penalty stop. Meanwhile, Hakkinen takes the checkered flag on the track. Michael's 10 seconds are up and he's off. Confusion reigns. No one's quite sure who's won in these unprecedented circumstances. But Michael Schumacher is declared the winner. It was easy up to the uh, pace car. Well, I wasn't fast enough. Couldn't hold the pace off uh, two guys in front of me. Obviously, I slowed down because there was no point pushing. It was very dangerous and I was quite happy that the pace car came out, actually. An amazing result for Schumacher, who had surely kissed his chances goodbye. Michael Schumacher takes his third consecutive win. A great result for Benetton with both drivers in the top six, while Ralph Schumacher gives Jordan their first point of the year. Schumacher's win has put him within two points of Mika Hakkinen, while Coulthard's championship hopes are fading now 26 points behind his teammate, just one point ahead of Irvine. It's a two-horse race in the Constructors' Championship with McLaren just three points ahead of Ferrari, with Benetton and Williams in third and fourth a long way behind. One of the most bizarre finishes in Grand Prix history began on lap 43, when Michael Schumacher passed Wurtz under a yellow flag. The penalty notice led to confusion. It's plus 10 seconds and we must stop. No, no. Time penalty. Time penalty. The mix-up occurred as a result of errors made by the stewards. Ferrari were not only given the wrong penalty and informed later than the rules allowed, but also received it so late in the race that they were entitled to bring Schumacher in for his punishment on his final lap, and thus crossing the finishing line in the pits. Confusion prevailed in the immediate aftermath of the Grand Prix, and due to the stewards' mistakes, no one was quite sure who had won the race. The only thing people were sure about was that they had no idea of what was going on. Ron Dennis was confused. We weren't advised that there was a penalty imposed. For that reason, we were pacing Mika because he'd sustained some front wing damage. So we could have pushed which is a normal thing. If there's a penalty, we're informed. Second thing is the penalty was taken after the start-finish line. And again, that seems to be wrong, but uh, we just have to make quite sure about the regulations and then we'll take whatever steps are appropriate. The terrible conditions impaired Michael Schumacher's judgment. I don't even remember I've passed him because, I mean, you pass someone but you don't even see because of the spray. And uh, that is the reason why you don't see uh, flex and if you, if you imagine I'm, I'm following someone that close, then you, you're lucky to see the road, that's it. We have to clarify now what, what uh, was the story and what we should have done. DC was upset at his team's decision to fit different tyres to his car. We went with intermediates again, and when I came out after my stop and Mika stop, I found out he was on the full wet and it kept raining, and I, I was immediately a bit frustrated in the car because I'm, I'm seeing more water go down in the track, and I know he's on the right tyre and I'm on the wrong tyre bit too much standing water and the tread filled up and I just aquaplaned off. My information from, from my side of the pit wall was that we felt it was going to dry up, so based on that it was the right tyre to go on, but uh, I need to try and understand what information they had on the other side to make them confident they choose a, a, the wet tyre, which clearly was the right tyre to go for. 
Max Mosley, president of the FIA Motorsports Governing Body, had the ride of his life in the back of the two-seater McLaren at Silverstone. Ex-Grand Prix driver Martin Brundle was his chauffeur and lapped the circuit at very similar speeds to that of the current race cars. An overawed Mosley said it was a fantastic experience. You're fine in it, believe me. I asked him over a coffee about 15 minutes ago. <laughs> Does he fancy it? He said, yes. This is the highly skilled engineer that has hand-built these machines. I've got to take a little bit out of here with me knife. Actor David Jason was also offered a spin. I was delighted to have, uh, you know, to have had a look at it. And I'll take up your invitation next time, but I want a bit more time to sort of uh, get the feel of it. The A1 ring in Austria and round 10 of the Formula One World Championship sees the first wet qualifying session since Belgium 1994, when Barrichello took pole position for Jordan. It was nearly 30 minutes before anyone ventured out. Takagi was not the only one caught out by the treacherous track. World champion Jacques Villeneuve sliding down to 11th on the grid. Dini is ending up in the gravel and 13th, whilst Fizzy Keller is just a passenger in his own car. Conditions proving too much also for the Rainmeister, Michael Schumacher having to start the race from fourth. Even the peerless McLaren was affected, Hakkinen having to fight to stay on track for third. In the end, the weather produced a radical grid, with a Lacey taking provisional pole just seconds from the end of the session. But the flying Fisichella was causing uneasy times in the Sauber garage. Giancarlo's Benetton displacing the French driver on the very last lap of the session, taking his first Formula One pole position to the disappointment of the Sauber crew. The Italian's superbly driven and well-timed lap was met by tears of joy from his girlfriend, while Jean was not too disgruntled with second on the grid. Race day and blue skies, the spectators are contented, as is Fisichella at the front. Buoyant Brazilian Barrichello starts a competitive fifth, whilst David Coulthard looks around in unfamiliar territory back in 14th. As the heat begins to rise, the Austrian Grand Prix is under starter's orders. Wheel spinning. Off the line with Alessi, not the start the French Sicilian wanted as Hakkinen slips by to take second. Now alongside Fisichella and first place going into turn one. That's Takagi losing it on the approach, and he touches Tuero, and Herbert has to take avoiding action. Hakkinen is leading Schumacher. Deniz slides into his teammate and Coulthard. Salo attempts to recover and does a donut into David's front wing. DC's in for repairs, but Salo's race is over. With just one lap under yellow, the safety car pulls off and the race is on. Hakkinen leads, Michael Schumacher is second, Fisichella is down to third, Barrichello is up to fourth, and Alessi is fifth. On the outside as they run downhill approaching the turn, Schumacher is breaking late, going for it, but runs offline allowing Fisichella into second. Heartbreak for Barrichello and team boss Jackie Stewart as Rubens retires with brake problems. Michael Schumacher is wasting no time and steals back second off Giancarlo and is back in pursuit of Mika, cruising up to the back of the McLaren, now only three tenths behind. David Coulthard is slicing his way through the field. Lab 16 and Frentzen has a problem. There's smoke pouring out of the back of his Williams and his Mechachrome is blowing up in spectacular fashion. Schumacher is closing in on Hakkinen. He runs wide, bouncing over the sand and losing his wing. Front row drivers Fisichella and Alessia are battling for fifth now, approaching Remus, and both are eliminated on the spot. Peter Sauber is not amused. A brilliant qualifying is wasted. Back on track with Jacques Villeneuve now, albeit temporarily as he takes to the grass, but manages to keep it going. Mika Hakkinen is pushing his Bridgestone shod McLaren to the limit. As his teammate Coulthard runs wide. A recovering Michael Schumacher is now up with brother Ralph and they almost touch as they battle for fourth. 
a relieved Eddie Jordan. He doesn't give up though, with Ralph holding him out for a further four laps before Michael eventually dives down the inside and gets past. Only five seconds from Irvine. And Schumacher passes Eddie for third with only three laps to go. But it's Mika's day taking his fifth win of the season. Coulthard coming from the back of the grid to second in an incredible drive. McLaren are jubilant. It was, it was excellent uh, victory. Team played a very important part of this race and I think we made excellent tactics and, and we had a one fuel stop race and that was definitely uh, ideal for me and I was able to go flat out all the time. I did not have any problems really. Hacken and McLaren are back on top. Mika Hakkinen's win has put the brakes on Michael Schumacher's and Ferrari's amazing run of results, while Ralph Schumacher scores points again for Jordan in fifth. None of us would have expected that I would be so far back in the grid, but these conditions, uh, you have to be on the ball, and I wasn't, so I paid the price. The Austrian Grand Prix was characterised by some astounding comeback drives. Coulthard's 14th place grid slot meant that he was involved in some back-of-the-grid antics. Having got away with just a knock, I then had Mika Salo spin into my front wing and I thought, God, I just, I can't believe the way this, this race is going already. Tom Walkinshaw was unhappy with his team's performance, as was Mika Salo, whose race was ultimately finished at the second corner. Well, if you are taken off when the, from the race by your own team, you shouldn't be very happy about it. Coulthard managed to get back to the pits. He's got a new nose and a fresh set of tyres, quick 5,000 service and he's on his way. I was very lucky that after getting involved in the second corner accident that there was a safety car that allows me to change the wing and rejoin at the back of the pack. And I have to say, you know, uh, a compliment to all the drivers that I overtook because they were 100% fair. You know, he started in well back on the crate and, and he charged up to, uh, to his position, which is unbelievable. When I got the balance, I went flat out and then you saw the tap cap started coming bigger and bigger for Michael and then Michael went off. So, uh, brilliant. Uh, in the end of the day, it was a stupid mistake by myself. I went off the line, and as you off the line, there's so much uh, dust that uh, you have no chance to just run wide. I thought it was bigger damage, to be honest. Uh, there was enough damage, anyway, to, to come in with, without the front wing for one lap, which cost me a lot of time. Great pit stop of the guys. Uh, changed the wing and uh, went back into the race from 16th and uh, came third. It was quite a nice challenge and uh, in that uh, sense it was quite exciting. Accusations of team orders when Eddie Irvine mysteriously slowed, allowing Michael Schumacher through to third. All race I was going forward in the brakes and um, there was lots of dust coming out of the front brakes and then I was starting to get a longer pedal so I thought it was better to go back on the, on the brake balance, which I did. Now I had to back off because the car was very loose and, Michael was catching me, but it was, to be honest, there's no point fighting with Michael, you know. We were very marginal on break, both of us. Uh, Eddie seemed to be a bit worse than me, and uh, the team asked us to slow down. And uh, at one stage, I was able to overtake Eddie then. This is the time of year when people are talking about all these changes. I was happy at Williams, but I, I expect next year to be an interim season and I don't want to, to do another season like this one. Villeneuve announced that he's moving to British American racing next season. There were a lot of positives. Uh, the people in the team are people I worked with in the past and uh, I know they can do a very good job. Michael Schumacher stays with Ferrari for $25 million. The most important reason is I haven't really finished uh, my job. I want to, to be world champion together with Ferrari. What am I bid? Four million, four and a half million. It's a very stable and, and, and very uh, good relationship we have between each other. However, what are Shinji Nakano's plans? Well, for the future, I don't know. <laughs> Long straights characterize Hockenheim, the circuit hosting the German Grand Prix and round 11 of the 98 championship. Boris Becker is not the only one who can serve an ace, advantage to Hakkinen who starts from pole. 
The German crowd, though, are predominantly Michael Schumacher fans. David Coulthard is lining up second on the grid with Jacques Villeneuve in a competitive third. There's not much for the Ferrari fans to sing about or Michael to smile about. He starts ninth. Keep the revs up and drop the clutch. Schumacher's avoiding the slow-starting Benetton as we join Villeneuve in car as both the Jordans drive by. Hakkinen is leading Coulthard round the first corner. And back with Villeneuve, who is passing Hills Jordan for fourth place. Ralf Schumacher is in third, whilst Michael is having a go at Fisichella on the approach to the first chicane. The Italian and the German are side by side, but Giancarlo is unable to stop Michael from getting by. Race order, Hakkinen, Coulthard, Ralf Schumacher, Villeneuve, Hill, Irvine and Michael Schumacher in seventh. On board with Michael now, as the Ferrari pilot rides the curves through the corner and passes his teammate who runs wide. Hakkinen is out in front, but David Coulthard is not far behind in the second McLaren, while Ralf Schumacher is keeping them in check. Ralph is ordered to push, but it's his brother who takes up the order. Schumacher is having to drive his Ferrari to the limit. As Ralph takes the first of two scheduled pit stops, with most of the other teams opting for one, it will have to be quick. The race is between the frontmen Hakkinen and Coulthard as they approach half race distance. Lap 26, and Meek is in for his one and only stop. As the McLaren crew set to work, the Finn will be hoping that there are no problems. David is caught in traffic. That won't help him stay in front. It's the Scotsman's turn now, but he's overshot his garage, adding precious seconds to his stop. The team have done a good job, but can he get out in front of Hakkinen, who is tearing down the straight? It's a race for turn one, and Mika takes it. Hakkinen is leading with Coulthard right behind, but the Williams of Jacques is closing. Problems at McLaren. As Irvine chases down Fizzy Keller and runs wide at the chicane. Hakkinen has to run his car lean, says Ron. Villeneuve clears his vision, keeping the pressure on the two McLarens. But it's the last lap and Mika wins. Coulthard is second and Villeneuve is third. Hill comes home a triumphant fourth and Michael Schumacher a disappointed fifth. Hockenheim is Mika's second consecutive win and Michael could do nothing to stop it. It's another 1-2 for McLaren. And a 5-6 for the Schumacher brothers. Adrian Newey has shown he's appreciated whilst Mika gets a pat on the back and a thumbs up. But can McLaren keep it up? Hungary is basically opposite than Hockenheim. It is the circuit carrying a lot of downforce. So you need a very good power from your engine and good balance for your car. And we got it. Mika certainly has got it. McLaren score their fifth 1-2 of the season, while Villeneuve's first podium finish and Hill's maiden points push Michael Schumacher down to fifth and Ralph into sixth. After 11 rounds, Hakkinen has a 16-point lead over Schumacher, with Coulthard in third and Irvine in fourth. Wurtz and Villeneuve round off the top six. McLaren lead the Constructors' League with 118 points. Ferrari are second with 92, while Williams are back in fourth. Hockenheim saw one of the worst Grand Prix meetings of Michael Schumacher's career. It started poorly when he lost one of the practice sessions, spinning off on his first flying lap. It looks as though uh, he must have hit a patch of dirt or something or other and just lost it, but uh, I don't think the car's damaged. It's going to be unfortunate because we'll lose the first practice session. The Ferrari star's fortunes didn't improve in the second session when he had to pull off with engine problems, losing him set-up time and qualifying only ninth. The last two laps, uh, both of them were, weren't clean. I had then to slow down in the last uh, try to, to get another run, but then the tie is not at their best anymore. But still, I mean, uh, we simply too slow. We should have, uh, we should have been able to, to be much closer, but we are not. More disappointment was to follow for Schumacher. In his home race, he struggled with the uncompetitive Ferrari all afternoon, but could finish no better than fifth. I mean, after qualifying, it was obvious that we we're going to struggle and uh, to, to be in fifth position, as we have seen, was the maximum we could do. So we have to be satisfied. McLaren had a problem of their own when not enough fuel went into Hakkinen's car at his pit stop. Uh, we had to uh, get some fuel back, which we did by uh, just changing the engine settings. It wasn't uh, critical, but it was worth paying attention to. Um, was happy with the team performance again. Very good. Although slightly affecting Mika's performance, the Finn wasn't too concerned. I had some loss of power during the race. Uh, it did not influence too much for my driving, but definitely it made me worried a bit. 
Jacques Villeneuve had his best race weekend of the year at Hockenheim, qualifying third behind the two McLarens. In the race, he kept pace with Hakkinen and Coulthard and even pushed them towards the end. It was a champion drive that earned recognition from the other racers and gave Patrick Head reason to be confident. I think that's our first podium of the year, so uh, it, you know, it, it's certain improvement and not far behind, but we've got to build from here and you know, the target is to try and get back in and be a serious front competitor by the end of the year. Villeneuve was also encouraged. We're pointing our nose uh, closer and closer to the front and um, hopefully we'll, we'll smell the fresh air soon. Self-styled playboy Eddie Irvine is back in the hot seat next year after re-signing for Ferrari. It's good to get it out of the way, you know. It's always a little bit distracting, but uh, obviously the situation with Michael being on the team is not ideal for me. So, uh, you know, I think one-year contracts under certain conditions are very, very good. And I think the conditions are perfect for both of us um, to have a one-year contract. All the drivers were interested in driving for us. We went through a process to determine which the team wanted to choose and the decision that we ultimately took was to stay with the two drivers who've done a great job for us. They are two of the best. More importantly, they're getting better. We agreed this was the best way forward and we're delighted with the outcome. The Hungara Ring Budapest for the Hungarian Grand Prix. Three quarters of the way through the season now, and Mika Hakkinen starts round 12 with a 16 point lead in the title race and pole position. David Coulthard joins his teammate on the front row, whilst Michael Schumacher is half a second off the pole time and starts third. Countdown to the start, and off they blast. Hakkinen is away well. In car with Irvine, Schumacher is laying down the rubber. Down to turn one, and the field filter through. Hakkinen leads, Coulthard is second, Michael Schumacher is third, Irvine is fourth, Hill is fifth, and Villeneuve is sixth. Eddie Irvine is out early in the race with gearbox failure. No such problems for Schumacher, who is pressuring Coulthard for second. Lap 25, and Michael is pitting in for his first stop. DC has a wild moment as he negotiates a corner, but manages to collect it. Schumacher's out of the pits, but stuck in fourth place behind Villeneuve as Mika Hakkinen leads the Hungarian Grand Prix. Schumacher's passed Villeneuve, but now has Coulthard in his way. Catching traffic, I want him in this lap. Pronti, tutti fuori, tutti fuori. Ross Braun is deciding to try an alternative strategy by bringing his driver in early in an attempt to outsmart McLaren. It's a lightning stop. Ron Dennis is responding by calling Mika in early in a bid to keep track position. The McLaren pit crew are working as quickly as they possibly can, but will it be quick enough? Schumacher's flying down the straight, being willed on. And he's through into first position to the cheers of his team. Mika is now second and David Coulthard is third. It's all gone wrong for Dennis and McLaren, but the crowd are happy. The race is not over yet. Schumacher needs to pit again, but the McLarens can run to the end. Jean Todd is clearing the way with the help of Eddie Jordan and Ralph Schumacher as Michael storms round. Lap 52 and on board with the German. He tries too hard, running wide and losing time, but no damage done. Hakkinen is lapping slower and holding up teammate Coulthard, the Scotsman eventually getting past. Mika has radioed in. He has a serious handling problem with his car. Lap 62 and Schumacher has a 29 second lead as he comes in for his final pit stop. The mechanics are working flat out to get the double world champion out in front of the McLaren. Michael exits the pits in first place with five seconds in hand over the chasing David Coulthard. Jacques Villeneuve is now passing the wounded McLaren of Mika. The best place is on the straight. Advice for Hill who is passing Hakkinen and is now up to fourth. 
Michael Schumacher is lapping the stricken McLaren and goes on to take the checkered flag and his fifth win of the year. Joy at Ferrari. David Coulthard comes home second. An astounding win for the Ferrari ace. I mean, you dream about uh, the ideal result and that was one of the, the dreams I had, but the maximum I was thinking to achieve was being first and make a second. What happened today is obviously ideal for the championship. Ideal indeed as Michael washes away the trials of the last couple of races. Villeneuve and Williams are back on form with their second successive podium. Jordan are also improving with Damon Hill. Despite his problems, Hakkinen finishes in sixth. The outcome of the Hungarian Grand Prix could prove crucial at the end of the year. Mika Hakkinen was the fastest driver on the circuit all weekend until a mysterious handling problem developed at his McLaren. Mika, now lapping a couple of seconds slower, fell back into the clutch of the pursuing field, losing position after position until he had fallen to sixth place. I got a technical problem in the car, front end of the car. It was impossible to drive, but uh, I will tell you a little bit later. I, I got to speak to the team first and I come back, yeah? Ron Dennis was unable to explain Mika's problem. Possibly a differential failure, possibly a front shock absorber, um, or something else, but uh, on the, about five laps after his first pit stop, um, the problem materialized and he just coped as best as he could. After the start, it didn't look like uh, there was any chance to get by. We then optioned uh, a three-stop strategy, which initially uh, seemed to be the wrong thing because I was behind Jack. Uh, the two guys uh, came out in front of me after their pit stop, which was supposed to be the other way around. I, I was supposed to be in front of them. And I thought, now I'm really stuck and in trouble. And I really started uh, worrying actually about p uh, position three. But then the race developed uh, in a way where I thought as well, is still a long way to go. Let's keep going and pushing, and uh, finally it worked. Strategy was the key word at the Hungara ring, where passing on track is almost impossible. As soon as Michael came out in front of me, I realised that he must be on a, a different stop strategy, and I didn't think he would be able to go quick enough to, to pull out the gap. I spent a few laps behind Mika after his stop, lost a couple of seconds a lap there. Uh, the pace he was able to run uh, was, was way quicker than, than we could and uh, I was just up against the brick wall, couldn't go any quicker, and that's where he was managed to pull out 25 seconds. Strategy matched raw speed. At one stage I was uh, first where I didn't know I was uh, first, and that was the reason why I went off, because I was pushing so hard to keep actually in contact that uh, I then had a little off, which still meant uh, I was able to pull enough gap after the last pit stop coming out in front of uh, Damien with uh, Five second lead and that was it. The Prost team, which has been uncompetitive this year, announced that it has re-signed Trulian Panis for next season. Team boss Alain Prost tied up a two-year deal with Jano, while Olivier is only committed for 1999. Oh, okay. While Schumacher took possession of an all-new 1.2 million pound colour-coordinated motorhome. Belgium and the Spa-Francorchamps circuit for round 13. Conditions are far from ideal, but someone with a clear track in front of them is Mika Hakkinen starting in pole. Coulthard is lining up beside him in second, while a storming lap by Damon Hill places him third on the grid. Schumacher starts in fourth, but with four wins here and a wet track, it looks good for him. The circuit is drenched as they peel off the grid. Hill is getting a bad start. Hakkinen is leading the charging pack down to La Source, while Coulthard is being passed by Villeneuve. Jock's clear about what he wants. Not so clear, though, is Eddie Irvine's view from the cockpit. Racing down the hill and Coulthard's out of shape. Bouncing off the barrier and across the accelerating field. There's a chain reaction. The drivers with nowhere to go but into each other. Complete mayhem. Wheels and debris flying in all directions. Norbert Haug is visibly shocked as thankfully all the drivers vacate their wrecks unaided. Twelve cars are involved, including both Pross and Barrichello, as the drivers run back to the pits to prepare for the restart. 18 of the 22 drivers are back on the grid in their spare or repaired cars. 
Leaving the grid for the second time, Hill has a much better start and he's alongside Hakkinen into the first corner. And he's through to first place. While Schumacher takes a tight line squeezing Hakkinen. They've touched and Mika is spinning and that's Herbert. They're both out. Schumacher in third is right with teammate Irvine approaching Le Kuhn, And he's through to second and now chasing Hill. DC and Verts are caught in the gravel trap. Behind the safety car, the positions are Hill at the front, Michael Schumacher is second, Irvine is third, Alacy is fourth, and Villeneuve is fifth. David has rejoined, but at the tail of the field, as the safety car pulls off, Damon Hill and Michael Schumacher reacquaint themselves with the fight for first. Eddie Irvine is out of third and losing his wing, another victim of the atrocious conditions. Michael Schumacher is on the outside of Hill in a brave move around Blanchemont. Into the bus stop, and the Germans through into the lead. Conditions are deteriorating as Hill has a hairy moment lapping truly. Out of contention is DC. Out of the mist and coming up to lap the McLaren is Schumacher, who has zero visibility. Jean Tot is requesting cooperation and gets it. Behind the wall of spray, Schumacher follows closely, too closely, and he's rammed the back of the McLaren, losing the right front of his Ferrari. Panic in the pits, but there's nothing they can do as Michael pulls in to retire, followed by Coulthard. The furious Ferrari driver is on his way to the McLaren garage to have a word with DC, but his team are holding him back, trying to keep him at a safe distance this time. Meanwhile, Hill, who is now leading, is finding the track a trifle slippery. Eddie Jordan contemplates his first win. Even though several laps down, McLaren are sending Coulthard back out. The attrition rate rises as Fisichella climbs out of his stricken Benetton. The replay shows the Italian slamming violently into the rear of Meccano. Then, helpless to stop, he slides towards the pit lane entrance. David Richards looks on in disbelief as Oliver Gavin's services are called upon again, pacing the two Jordans, which are running one and two. Eddie puzzles over Ron's request to help Coulthard into the points. The race over the final 11 laps is on. Hill is leading Ralph Schumacher with a lacy in third. Eddie can barely watch the final moments as Damon Hill rounds the last turn to take the checkered flag and a historic win for Jordan. The Irishman is overcome, whilst Peter Sauber is elated with a Lacey's third place. Thumbs up for Jordan. We want to get out and celebrate this because it's a great, uh, great day for us, for Mugen Honda, for Jordan and... Uh, and for the team, you know, it's, uh, it's brilliant. Damon bounces back in Belgium. Damon Hill wins the Belgium Grand Prix, his first since leaving Williams. And with Ralph Schumacher in second, a Lacey on the podium and truly in the points, it's a weekend of firsts. Spectators at the Belgium Grand Prix witness one of the most spectacular multiple collisions in Formula One history. Considering the extent of the damage, it was a testament to the safety of the modern Grand Prix cars that there were no serious injuries, although some drivers were not happy, one of whom was Rubens Barrichello. Somebody hit me from behind, then I hit another one in front, then I start spinning around and hit it, hit it, hit it, and it's just a nightmare because on these conditions we've learned in the past that we need the pace car to, to start. Salo was another involved. First thing I saw, I had a Ferrari side vest right in front of me, and I was already up to fifth gear, and there's nothing I could do. I just hit him straight and straight on the side, and uh, as soon as I hit him, somebody hit me from behind as well, and uh, it was just big chaos everywhere. Eddie Irvine received attention to his knee, but was able to take the restart, as was David Coulthard, whose out-of-control McLaren began the chain reaction. There was controversy at Spa when Michael Schumacher accused David Coulthard of deliberately trying to take him out of the race. The incident began when Jean Tot asked for Ron Dennis's cooperation when Schumacher was coming around to lap DC. Well, David got the order to let Schumacher pass. Uh, David slowed down a little bit, went to the right, and, and uh, well, Michael just hit him. With such a heavy impact, it looked as though both drivers were finished for the day, but David managed to get back out. Damon Hill is back to his winning ways. I got lucky on the first start, but uh, I made a beautiful second start. And once I was away, I was, um, I was looking good. Damon Hill into first place, but it wasn't long before Schumacher was passed and opening up a lead. Until that was, he hit the back of the McLaren. And I heard he was out of the race, so, um, you know, you don't uh, have time to get too emotional about things. It's just a, 
it's a very um, <clears throat> you know responsible position when you're in the lead. So uh, I focused on what I needed to do to keep the lead. But there was trouble ahead. Well, it was always going to be um, quite close when they brought the safety car out. So I knew that Ralph was um, going to be pushing me all the way. With his lead wiped out, Damon managed to keep Ralph behind him until the end. Well, after the safety car where we were together, we just settled. But uh, we had to keep pushing a little bit because, um, obviously, Jean was pushing us. The Belgian Grand Prix was Eddie Jordan's best race by far since entering Formula One. I wanted to make sure that the team finished 1-2, and that was the way we tried very hard to be a play very fair in this business. And um, they pushed each other very hard, but 1-2 is something quite remarkable. Driving a Ferrari in Monza during the weekend of Grand Prix in front of everybody is a specialty. A masterpiece of motoring. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful to be here at Monza. There's always a special atmosphere here. Historic Monza is the venue for the Italian Grand Prix, home of the passionate Tifosi and Ferrari who both have something to celebrate this weekend. Michael Schumacher is on pole for the first time this year, and it's the Italian team's 600th Grand Prix. Jacques Villeneuve lines up beside the German on the grid in second, whilst Mika Hakkinen could only manage third on a drying track. Apprehension mounts as the 22 drivers wait for the signal to go. Mika is off the grid well and is moving to the front. But an appalling start for Schumacher, who is dropping from first to fifth. Racing down to the first chicane, Hakkinen is leading the tightly packed field. Frentzen is taking to the grass, but they're all through safely. Schumacher is recovering, taking a position back from Villeneuve and moves up to fourth. Hakkinen is first, Coulthard is second, Irvine, Michael Schumacher, Villeneuve and De Lacy. Schumacher is all over the back of his teammate now, and he's through to third place. Mika is four and a half seconds ahead of the Ferrari, but Ron Dennis can see Michael is catching quickly. Coulthard is passing the slowing Mika, whilst Hill is making up places with some daring overtaking. Hakkinen, who is second, is being caught by Schumacher. Nakano is all burnt out, retiring on lap 13. With race leader Coulthard now, and that's his engine expiring. He's pulling off the circuit, leaving a wall of smoke. Hakkinen is blind as he navigates his way through. And that's allowed Michael Schumacher to close right up on the fin, pressuring Mika to take a tight line into the corner. And the German has the speed as they come out of the turn. And he's through to lead the Italian Grand Prix to the delight of the Tifosi. Lap 31, and Ferrari prepare for Schumacher's one and only pit stop at the race. With a nine-second lead on Hakkinen, he will come out in second, but Mika still has to pit. Lap 34, and leader Hakkinen is suffering a handling problem. Pitting in now, his team have the opportunity to rectify it. Problem solved, Mika is now catching the Ferrari of Michael Schumacher. With Villeneuve now, and he's losing grip, coming out of the second Lesmos, and he's out. Schumacher is now coming around to lap Fisichella, but Jean Todd is taking no chances. The Ferrari's through, but Hakkinen is still pushing hard, pushing too hard, as his McLaren skates backwards across the gravel, spraying the track with stones. Mika has managed to keep the engine alive, but the spectators have other reasons to cheer. Their man, Schumacher, now has an unchallenged lead as Hakkinen resumes. Running off the pace, Eddie Irvine makes short work of getting past the McLaren for second place. Schumacher Jr. can see a podium position and wastes no time in taking it. While Schumacher Sr. wins his second race in a row, teamwork paying off.
for quite a, a number of laps we were uh, challenging each other. And then there was uh, this tremendous uh, engine blow, so we had both really to slow down a big time. He then uh, <coughs> lost it into the chicane, so I could out accelerate him after the chicane into the first Lesmo, and uh, that decided the race for me. The lines are drawn, the championship is going down to the wire. Michael Schumacher, the winner and the leveller. Irvine finishing second to complete Ferrari's second 1-2 of the year. With Ralph on the podium, Hakkinen could only manage fourth. It's a dead heat at the top of the Drivers' Championship, with Hakkinen and Schumacher both on 80 points. Coulthard in third has the advantage in the Brits race. Ferrari in second are now only 10 points shy of McLaren in the Constructors' standings, while only two points separate the race for third between Williams, Benetton and Jordan. After beating Michael Schumacher off the grid, Mika Hakkinen managed to keep the Ferrari driver at bay in the early stages. But it wasn't long before the German was right behind Mika, hounding him for second position. However, David Coulthard's Mercedes blew just ahead of the sparring pair, creating a smokescreen. Michael Schumacher explains. It made it impossible to see through the corner and you didn't know where is the car, so we had both really to slow down a big time. Mika actually went onto the grass. With Schumacher right on his tail, Hakkinen protected his line, which resulted in a slow exit speed out of the chicane. Michael had the momentum and was able to get past before the next corner. Hakkinen began to drop back and it transpired that all was not well with his McLaren. Uh, had some sort of braking problem. Um, not sure what at this stage, but uh, obviously enough to cause him to spin. I indeed spun, and it was quite a horrendous spin too. After that, it was still seven or eight laps to go. I had to try without brakes, obviously. I have a certain uh, opportunity to brake the car a little bit by brakes, but I thought if I use them more, they're going to explode completely, like happened to me many years ago. So I don't want to experience that again. Australia, 1994, Mika's brakes failed on his McLaren, and although he emerged unscathed, it was an experience he won't forget. So I have to brake with the gears all the time, and it was just, just a not pleasant moment to be driving the Formula One car without brakes. Even without the use of his brakes, Mika still managed to bring his McLaren home in fourth place, which means the prospect of an exhilarating finale. Last time I think I said it's going to be exciting to end the season. I think it's definitely getting now exciting. Johnny Herbert had a torrid weekend when he spun off on lap 13 through no fault of his own. When I spun, I had a problem with, uh, I found some pliers. They're actually laying in, inside the car. Unhappy at Sauber, Johnny is looking forward to driving for Jackie Stewart next season. Also announced this week was the signing of Champ Cars champion Alex Zanardi by Williams for 1999. The Italian drove for Lotus before moving to the US based series where he has been very successful. Joining Zanardi at Williams next season is Ralph Schumacher, who was exchanged by Jordan for Heinz Harold Frensen. Eddie and Heinz Harold are old acquaintances. He drove here for us uh, in 1990 in Formula 3000. We've known him for a long time and we're very pleased that he's back with us. T minus 10. Lift off. Lift off. for Michael Schumacher. Michael. <laughs> the Nürburgring in Germany is the stage for the Luxembourg Grand Prix and the penultimate round of the World Championship. Schumacher fans are out in force and Michael doesn't disappoint them, taking pole position. With Eddie Irvine alongside him, Mika Hakkinen has been pushed down to third on the grid. Michael Schumacher, equal points leader, knows he needs to make a good start. This could be his last chance as they leave the grid. Eddie Irvine's made a tremendous start and is inching ahead of Schumacher as they approach turn one. Ferrari first and second with the two McLarens behind. Not what Mercedes Norbert Haug wanted to see. Fireworks in Germany as the field make their way around Dunlop Kerr. In car with Schumacher as Irvine loses it over the curbs. Michael has the speed and he goes through with the team's approval. Schumacher, Irvine, Hakkinen, Coulthard, Fisichella and Wurtz. Hakkinen is right with Irvine now and chasing. 
Tucked in behind and he pulls up alongside into the chicane and he's past the Irishman to the disappointment of the Ferrari crew. Mika is now second, over seven seconds behind Michael as the German comes in for the first of two stops. Meanwhile, Hakkinen is really getting the hammer down. Schumacher's back out in traffic and is not helped by Verstappen. Ron Dennis waits for the Finn, who is now in for his stop. His well-drilled pit crew set to work. Adrian Newey knows it's crucial if they are to get out in front of Michael Schumacher, who is on the pit straight. Jean Todd looks on as Hakkinen exits the pits and he's out in front of the German. Both are on the limit, charging through the turn. Ferrari are outmaneuvered. Further down the field, there's wheel-to-wheel -wheel action with Heinz Harold Frenson, Fisichella and Wirtz vying for position. Mika Hakkinen is still leading, but he has Michael Schumacher stuck to his tail. While the battle behind continues, and that's Fisichella running wide and allowing Frenson through on home soil. Mika's using all the road while Michael needs a little more. Schumacher's in for his second pit stop and doesn't hang around. Back on the circuit and Mika's in the thick of traffic as Michael puts pedal to metal. Hakkinen's turn now and he's even quicker. Dennis is quietly confident. The Finn exits the pit lane as Schumacher bears down and Mika keeps his lead. That's a Jordan off track. It's Ralph Schumacher who rejoins the circuit. The German waves to the crowd as he tours in. His race is over with a terminal problem. Back with Hakkinen, who now has a comfortable lead over Michael Schumacher with just a few laps to run. In car and in first place, Mika Hakkinen is victorious, taking his seventh win of the year. The Finn blowing away Ferrari as Schumacher finishes in second place. We've raced here last year and David and me were, we were first and second running comfortably and, and uh, we failed this year. I think uh, Mercedes showed they can, they can fix problems and they can be the best. And today they showed that and I'm glad it happened here. Really good show. No problems for Mika with one race to go. Mika's win gives him a vital four-point advantage over Michael Schumacher going into the final round. With their teammates third and fourth, Frenzel and Fisichella complete the top six. Mika Hakkinen drove one of the best races of his career to win at the Nürburgring. It certainly makes my situation uh, a little bit different than it was uh, a couple of hours ago. To win in this Grand Prix, it obviously uh, gives us advantage for the championship and, and uh, it just gives more motivation for the team to prepare the car even better for the next Grand Prix. Mika was helped by his McLaren having the edge on Ferrari. We're going to test uh, quite a lot. We will have a heavy program, uh, as I guess everyone will have uh, those guys and, and ourselves. So it's going to be another race uh, within the next four weeks to see who uh, wins that uh, for Suzuka. The break between the end of the Luxembourg Grand Prix and the Japanese Grand Prix will be anything but a break for the two championship contender teams. Both Ferrari and McLaren have heavy testing schedules planned in their bid to ensure that they have the most competitive car when they arrive in Suzuka. Although Ferrari, with their private test track, are spending about double the time McLaren are. It's painstaking work for the mechanics who have to check and test every component for reliability and efficiency. But how do the drivers feel the hard work has been going? We are here today testing and trying to improve the car even more before we go to last Grand Prix. And uh, I believe we have done again some progress to the car, so I'm looking forward extremely. Kulfard's job is to help his teammate win the championship. Doing some tyre comparisons and just generally trying to work in some small developments for Suzuka. While Ferrari are looking for something special. I don't believe there's anything that he can see that he hasn't already seen. It's the same car we've had since Melbourne. Michael eyes up the opposition. The psychological battle is as important as the technical one. I think that Mika has the advantage and I don't think anyone could uh, begrudge him the championship. I think he deserves it. He's driven very well this year. He's had reliability and he should win it. It's 19 years since Ferrari last won the title and no expense has been spared so as not to disappoint their patient and loyal fans. With the pressure on, Michael Schumacher is relaxed and calm, but is Mika even cooler?
would say Mika. It's obvious, me. Okay. Chumaha! Yay! You are champion! Chumaha! Hakine! Well, I can tell you, uh, Mika's the coolest person in the team at the moment. I'm in awe of his uh, self control. That's what, what is the intention to target, to, 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 to come here like a normal race, but obviously it's not. But now it's a very important uh, race weekend, so many things. Uh, may happen. We needed to find a second anyway. We have found here and there some time. Whether it's enough, we will see. With the build-up over, it's time for business. The Japanese Grand Prix at Suzuka is the venue for the final and deciding round of the FIA 1998 Formula One World Championship. A truly international series as the contenders shake on a fair race. Mika Hakkinen starts behind this man, Michael Schumacher. The drivers are lined up on the grid and Mika is eager to get away, but the start is aborted. The team's nerves are on a knife edge as the pit crews prepare the cars for the restart. Truly as the offender, he'll start at the back. And that's Michael Schumacher. There's a problem. He stalled his engine. Norbert Haug checks the procedure. Schumacher can't believe it. He knows the consequences, as does Ferrari boss Luca Di Montezemolo. There are mixed emotions as the drivers wait for the restart. The track marshal stands in front of Michael Schumacher's car as the grid leads for their second formation lap. The Ferrari driver will have to wait before joining the back, where he will start the Japanese Grand Prix. Under starter's orders, and Mika Hakkinen takes the initiative, blasting off the grid. In car with Coulthard as Eddie Irvine and Heinz Harald Frensen get past. Hakkinen leads the field around the first curve as Schumacher charges from the back. Race order, Mika Hakkinen, Eddie Irvine, Heinz Harald Frensen, David Coulthard, Jacques Villeneuve and Damon Hill. And that's Schumacher on the attack, taking position after position off his fellow racers. Jean Todd keeps an eye on his progress as Michael passes his brother Ralph for seventh on lap four. The going will be slow from here though with the pack fighting their own race. Mika's still out in front and pulling away as Schumacher has trouble passing his old adversary Damon Hill who is fighting with Villeneuve. Damon's in for his pit stop as teammate Ralph pulls out of the race with a blown engine on Mugen's doorstep. Michael's now up to sixth and is pressuring Villeneuve for fifth place. He's got the speed out of the corner and passes with ease. Lap 17 and Hakkinen's in for his first stop. It'll have to be a quick one to get out in front of Irvine. And it is. The Finn is rejoining the circuit in front of the Irishman and retains his first place. The pit crew doing what they needed to. Schumacher is pushing, 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 setting fastest laps. That mistake shouldn't cost him too much time. Back with Hakkinen, who's cruising at the front. Tuero's leaving his braking late, and into Takagi throwing debris in all directions. In car with Michael as he passes the expensive Rex and onto the pit straight where his team wait anxiously. Schumacher's right behind Irvine now. And that's his tyre exploding. Surely his race is over. McLaren can't believe it as Michael Schumacher pulls off the circuit and onto the grass. Ferrari can't hide their feelings, neither can McLaren. Michael's 1998 championship is over. But the race isn't. Mika's still charging. Tyres smoking as fifth place Hill chases Frenson for fourth with Villeneuve just behind. Number one driver Mika Hakkinen comes round to win the Japanese Grand Prix and the Drivers World Championship in style, with Irvine bringing the lone Ferrari home in second. But they're still racing for fourth position as Damon dies down the inside of Frenson's Williams at the last corner of the race, putting one over on his 1999 teammate to give the Jordan team fourth place in the Constructors' title. Hakkinen fans are ecstatic, as is his wife Aya. <laughs> I don't know where to start uh, to, to tell my feelings. Since starting a uh, Formula 1 1991, uh, uh, it has been a, a fight every year. It took a while, it took quite a long time, and now uh, it happened. And uh, looking all those times back, what we have done together and what we have achieved together in the past, uh, 
you can be happy about it. Because there has been such a hard work for everybody, uh, here we are, we won the championship. The hard work paying off as Mika, McLaren and Mercedes bathe in the glory. Mika takes his eighth win of the season with Irvine in second chasing him all the way. Coulthard is third and with Hill fourth, the two Williams drivers finish in the top six. All the red lights came on and I knew when they go off, you have to go for it. They didn't go <laughs> off, but the yellow light started flashing and it was, you know, you're so hyped up uh, for the start. So I, st I still went for it. And when I stopped the crit, all the mechanics was, all the mechanics was running to the car and, and checking everything. And, and uh, it was not happening to the other team car. I was sitting in a car and, and I was I was looking my engineers what they were doing the engine and, and in situations where we were because the temperatures get really really hot in a car and you can feel it yourself you know the heat coming from the engine Three and minutes. that makes me understand you know uh, what what our boys did again our mechanics it is was fabulous work they made it sure the car is cooled down the engine is cool and that did not happen to Michael. So I suppose he had a problem with the, with the temperatures of the engine or clutch or something like that. World champion Mika Hakkinen there raising the question crucial to the outcome of the Japanese Grand Prix. What caused Michael Schumacher to stall on the most important race of the year? But the clutch closed itself and then it stalled, so nothing really we, we could do. And because of the high temperature, I kept the RPM low, which was maybe a follow reason for that. Starting from the rear of the grid, Schumacher carved his way through the field. They couldn't keep me for long, so why not leave me uh, through and let me ride my race? I have to say thanks for all uh, those guys. Uh, obviously, uh, Damon uh, naturally is uh, not my best friend and uh, would make uh, rather things very difficult and a little bit easier. But uh, in the end of the day, uh, I don't care. The debris from this accident between Takagi and Tuero on lap 29 has been suggested as one of the potential causes of Schumacher's tyre blowout. The flailing rubber damaged the rear of Michael's bodywork, but he wasn't sure the debris was the cause. No, it just exploded the tyre, I don't know why, I didn't see any debris. I don't think I hit anything, but uh, hard luck. Schumacher thanked his team for their hard work. We've been extremely unlucky in the most important race of the season. This is a competition. And Ferrari boss Luca Di Montezemolo. The final driver standing shows that Mika Hakkinen beat season-long rival Michael Schumacher by 14 points to win the championship. Coulthard beat Irvine to third, while 1997 champion Villeneuve could only manage fifth. One point ahead of Hill in sixth. Frenson and Wurtz have 17 points each and finish 7th and 8th, while Fisichella and Ralph Schumacher round off the top 10 drivers. A poor season for Johnny Herbert, winning only one point and finishing the year 15th. In the Constructors' Championship, McLaren Mercedes take the honours, their first in seven years, while second place Ferrari scored the most points in the history of the sport without winning the title. Bridgestone are the tyre champions, Williams a third, Jordan fourth, their highest ever finish, Benetton fifth and Sauber sixth. Formula One says goodbye to Tyrrell and Goodyear. It's enabled me to uh, earn my living uh, in a business which I enjoy. Important of all, he won the race. <laughs> it was like a cash register going on in his head. I wouldn't like to have to stop doing it. I don't think so.
Well done.